Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us uh, today. And we're so honored and excited to be here in conversation with Cynthia Miller Idris from American University. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Javed Ali, and I'm currently an associate professor of practice here at the Ford School at the University of Michigan. And this uh, conversation today is supported by the Ford School. So our conversation will explore the key topics of radicalization, recruitment, and domestic terrorism. And we're really excited to, to have Cynthia's perspective on that. And let me just get into Cynthia's background for a bit for those who may not be as familiar with her work. So Cynthia is currently a professor in the School of Public Affairs and in the School of Education and runs the Pol Polarization and Extremism Research and Innovation Lab known as PERIL and the Center of Excellence at the American University. Uh, before her move into the School of Public Affairs in the fall of 2020, she was a professor of education and sociology at American University. Uh, professor uh, Millardris is a well-known expert, has testified before Congress, regularly briefs policy, security, education, and intelligence agencies in the United States and other stakeholders around the world. She's also, also the author of several books, the most recent, recent being uh, Hate in the Homeland, The New Global Far Right from Princeton University in 2020. And she's also authored um, a few books before that. She's got a great background, academic background in sociology and education and has used that to uh, leverage those insights now into the world of domestic extremism and, and domestic terrorism. Um, she also uh, is a proud graduate of the University of Michigan, Michigan and has her uh, master's degree and PhD from the School of Sociology, but also her master's degree from the Ford School of Public Policy here. So always great to see another Ford alum prospering uh, outside uh, the university. So Cynthia, welcome so much. Great to be here with you. And just in terms of the run of show for today, um, we're going to cover cover several backgrounds in our uh, cover, cover several issues in our conversation. Um, we're going to dive in a little bit about more into your background and how you um, started um, initially into the field uh, you did uh, look at academically and then how that has translated over into the world of domestic extremism and terrorism. Then we'll have some questions and conversation about uh, the, your uh, insights on domestic terrorism and how we're doing, uh, especially relative to other countries. We'll also look at the role of social media, and you've done a lot of um, research and analysis uh, on that. And then we'll hopefully wrap up our conversation with some discussion on policy uh, solutions. And then hopefully the last 10, 15 minutes, we'll take some questions and answers from the crowd. So a lot to get through. Um, but with that, Cynthia, again, welcome. Um, and let me just ask you uh, quickly. So you started your, your career initially on the academic um, front in a very different sort of field of sociology and education. And then it uh, over the last um, few years, it, it's shifted over into more of the national security world. So can you um, just share with our listeners and viewers how that started and um, you know, what lessons you've learned along the way now that you've, you've moved in these different uh, issues and areas of expertise? Sure. Um, well, first of all, thank you for having me, Javed. Thanks for hosting this. And uh, as you know, uh, personally, also as a U of M alum, there's nothing better than coming back home to, uh, to a place where you are a student. And I also had the opportunity to, to uh, speak with students in a class today in person. Um, it's just such a privilege to be here and really an honor. So I'm um, really enjoying my visit back to Ann Arbor and to campus. Um, so, you know, my background, as you said, is unconventional in the national security space. Um, I think that's probably an asset. And one of the reasons why I'm busy right now is because it's unconventional. But um, what I mean by that is I'm, I consider myself an accidental expert. Essentially, I did not seek out. It was not a strategic decision to pursue a path in national security. I was a German studies undergraduate major. I double majored in sociology. And then I went into uh, my PhD and policy background uh, degree programs here in order to study um, alternatives to college for young people. Uh, and I was really interested in the German vocational system. So I, that's what I was studying. I was doing a dissertation on um, transitions to adulthood and trying to understand how young people 
um, transition in an alternative time, an alternative structure the way they have in Germany, where two thirds of young people go through not a college bound track, but through a vocational track. But when I landed to do my dissertation, there was an upsurge in right wing extremism. I ended up spending 18 months as an ethnographer embedded in schools where teachers were really struggling to deal with the issue of resurgent right wing extremism. And so I became a kind of expert on school based responses to hate. And after another book, um, you know, two or three uh, uh, books that related to those issues, one of them was really tracking the mainstreaming of extremism, um, aesthetically, the changing encoded symbols, the way that iconography was being used to draw people in. And that got turned in just two months before Charlottesville happened. So that's when things really changed for me where people in this country started asking me to explain what was happening with the global and in interconnected kind of uh, resurgent far right. So that's that's what happened. It's been a little bit like whiplash and I keep saying, I wish my expertise were irrelevant again. Um, I'd like it to go back to being irrelevant, but uh, as long as it's not, um, I'm happy to continue to try to explain what, I, what I've learned. Thanks, Cynthia, for sharing that. And again, you've got a really interesting background and set of skills that I, I would argue makes you um, really unique uh, in this in this space. So let's um, dive into the domestic terrorism landscape the way you see it. And again, you've been looking at this or different features of it um, for for several decades now. So kind of first question, um, what do you think is most striking about it now? And in the context of, of what we're seeing in the United States mm -hmm. versus when you started, even if your the lens you were looking at may not have been as focused on the national security side going back. Then. Yeah, I think the, the biggest change um, over the past couple of decades for me on the on the domestic extremism front is the, the what I what, what I and other colleagues in the field now call a shift to post organizational forms of extremism, which means that although groups do still matter, um, they do produce a lot of propaganda, they sometimes get involved in plotting, um, you know, bad actor plots, militias, for example, unlawful militias, and there are white supremacist groups, including lots uh, that are on trial right now in Charlottesville. Uh, so groups matter, but the vast majority of exposure and radicalization to uh, extremist content in the US and globally right now is not happening through groups itself, but rather through online kind of radicalization within networks. Um, so it's not just totally lone actors all by themselves either, but they're working in networks, they're exposed in networks, they are exposed through a broad range of platforms. And I know we're gonna talk about social media later, so I won't, I won't go totally down that pathway, but it's, you know, I, I can't emphasize enough how different that is from 20 years ago or even 15 years ago, when in order to get engaged with extremist ideas, you had to seek them out or you had to be invited to come join it. Um, now it's just much more coincidental that people will likely encounter them when online gaming or in other kind of hobby sites online uh, where those ideas come to them. So it's no longer a destination to be sought out. It's just something you encounter in your everyday lives, whether that's on a paper flyer on your college campus or um, in an online game. And so that changes the way that people can be drawn in and recruited the gateways through which they access these groups. And I think that's been the biggest, the single biggest change that I would, um, I would say has really transformed the landscape of how extremism has emerged. So we will pick up on that topic of social yeah. media, but I wanted to, to further get into sort of the landscape now and what may continue to to drive it in different ways going forward. So as you've already noted, social media is, is a big one and, and we've got some additional questions on that, but can you also um, provide some insights on other, what I would call key drivers that you mm -hmm. think have, have fueled this threat um, to, the, to the degree uh, that it exists right now? Yeah. I think, you know, one major thing that's happening is demographic change and demographic change is a reality. So, so there are these sort of things that are happening. Uh, the country is becoming less white. It's becoming more diverse. Uh, it's become, it's changing um, in, in lots of other demographic ways. And, um, and the way that propaganda uh, and disinformation um, is using that fact to present a sense of threat a sense of existential threat 
to uh, many Americans who might not otherwise be encouraged to see it that way, but then are um, receiving it that way. And so this is a global um, issue and there's a global conspiracy theory called the great replacement. I mean, the idea that that demographic change is being orchestrated for some nefarious purposes, power grabbing purposes by somebody else, some elites or some, some ethnic minority group, for example. Um, so that's a major change. Uh, a major driver is that there is actually factual things happening, but then the spread of disinformation can exploit those, uh, those facts and those changes. But we also have, and this is really important, I'm gonna use, a, 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 I'm gonna be very careful about my terms here, but there is a sense of precariousness that is bigger than there was um, 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. And by that, I, I don't mean economic security exactly, although there is some economic insecurity and uh, changing um, economic uh, outlooks for people, but it's a sense of precariousness, which is um, the sense that something could be taken away from you and or that you could lose something so for example one uh one really important study that i often cite um in the in the european context shows that people are not more likely to join the far right if they grew up unemployed uh sorry if they are unemployed they are not more likely to join the far right if they are actually unemployed but they are more likely if they grew up with an unemployed parent so there's an emotional sense of uh, something could be lost, you know, the fear, the, the knowledge. And so we have been seeing um, that often it's a sense that whether that's a sense that uh, a white majority country will be taken away or it's propaganda about Second Amendment rights or it's a disinformation about an election. Right. There is there's often a through line there that something could be taken away from you. And I think that's playing on this sense of precariousness. Um, and then the third thing I think is just the, the changing landscape of how easy it is to disseminate propaganda and disinformation in ways that make it harder for people to understand what's real and what isn't real. Um, and so we have just seen a broader range of belief in conspiracy theories over the past few years, even that um, it's, it's hard to believe that people, you know, that that many people might believe some of these conspiracy theories, but we've seen it. And so we know that people are encountering them more often and that there's more of it circulating than there was before. And so those, it's not just, you know, again, the paper mailings that had to go out through list serves or something um, from extremist groups in the eighties and nineties, but it comes across in really sophisticated um, iconographic representations that look pretty legitimate and then people start to believe them. Um, and so those are, I think, the sort of three things, the sense of precariousness, the reality of demographic change that gets weaponized um, by propaganda, and then, um, and then just the changing amount, the actual amount of disinformation and propaganda that people get confronted with in their everyday lives. Thanks, Cynthia, for, for sharing those observations. Let me ask you, uh, relatively provocative question. Do you think that January 6th was the culmination of this rising tide of anger and grievances and discontent and this, this broad, broad and, and fragmented movement? Or do you, because of the drivers you laid out and, and other ones, do you see this threat enduring for quite some time? And is there a way to to put some boundary on how long you think that hmm. heightened threat period will last? Well, I wish I had a more optimistic answer for you, but I, I don't think it was a culmination of something. I think it is um, more like the beginning of something, the beginning of a moment. It's just that what that moment becomes is evolving even as I speak, right? We're seeing such transformations um, and I would say, in the willingness to use political violence, even in tremendously spontaneous ways. And um, that I think is what we're at the beginning of. Um, so, you know, I do think it was a, uh, a moment in which a lot of different groups and individuals motivated by completely different things in ordinary circumstances came together. I think of it as a kind of lowest common denominator moment where they normally would never agree in, in, in real life or be able to um, unite across those boundaries. And as we know, the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville tried to unite the right in 2017. They failed. Um, it didn't work. They ended up more disintegrated after Charlottesville, organizationally speaking, than they were before. 
Um, I think this showed that actually you can get united across a spectrum of conspiracy theories and white supremacists and unlawful militias and QAnon and Proud Boys and a, a toxic mix of groups and a whole lot of people who were just ordinary voters, Trump voters who were mobilized, who all believed something about a, a sort of disinformation about the election and really felt compelled and called upon to thwart what they believed was a real threat to democracy. So I think that's where I think we're at the beginning of something. And we have been continuing to see the kind of spontaneous political violence and willingness of just ordinary individuals to be violent um, in strange and unexpected ways. And I expect that that's going to continue um, for several years. I think that we're not, uh, you know, there's a kind of genie out of the bottle situation now where it's going to be difficult to work purely on the preventative side to stop it. Um, but I'm also an optimist at heart. And I don't think that this is, you know, we're not headed toward the end times. I don't believe that that this is irreparable. I do think that we can pull it back. And I think focusing on democracy itself and on how to strengthen and protect democracy from the threats that come at us from the fringes is one strategy that can lead us in, into a better path. Thanks for that, um, Cynthia. And again, it's a tough question, but I, I figured you'd have a, a really good answer on that. Um, let's let's um, shift gears a little bit to the role of social media. And this is something that is absolutely uh, an area of strength for you. So um, much of your re recent work is focused on the impact of social media and fueling far-right extremism within youth subcultures in the United States and abroad. And your 2020 book, Hate in the Homeland, that I talked about before, dives into this in some really unique ways. So can you provide some of the key findings from the book and how, from what you've uh, assessed and studied, how social media-driven radicalization in the U.S. compares and contrasts with other com countries like Germany and, and elsewhere in Europe? Yeah, great question. So the way I think of this is that it's, social media is part of the story, but it's it's part of a broader online ecosystem of platforms, of places and spaces where you spend time online and ways that you engage online, all of which get exploited and weaponized by extremist groups. Um, and they've been really effectively weaponized on the far right, on the, especially on the white supremacist side, um, because they're so youth centered and they've been used in a way that is what I often call the weaponization of youth culture. So there's several different things going on here. One is the just the vast number of places and spaces where it happens. And so that's from online gaming platforms to the live streaming of um, certain kinds of combat sports tournaments that are that are set up by people with extremist intentions to draw people into um, the street fighting that they believe has to be, uh, you know, precede the, the race wars that they think are coming. I mean, so there's uh, online gaming platforms, there's, there's YouTube channels that are dedicated or used by extremist groups or propaganda that's created by individuals to on cooking shows or on makeup tutorials, right? Sort of everyday places where you could be in there on a platform looking up a DIY, you know, do it yourself kind of channel and then stumble because it gets recommended to you by an algorithm, somebody else watched it, stumble accidentally into extremist content that's embedded into something else. So it's not just like, oh, I have to go looking for this dark video, you know, that is promoting an extremist message. It's, it's very, um, it's almost like grooming as we think of it. It's, it's introduced in really gradual and seductive ways um, through other types of places and spaces where people might spend time. So that's, that's one of the things. But it's also, we have amplification of messages. So the live streaming functions are being used to turn a local terrorist or violent act into a kind of global performance. And we've seen that repeatedly with, with terrorist actors who have live streamed their attacks, including in Christchurch, New Zealand, for example. Um, we see extremist groups using the online ecosystems to crowdsource and fundraise and support, sell merchandise but also get donations on ordinary donation platforms that then find out it gets reported and they shut them down. But it's like a constant whack-a-mole kind of a thing. So there's just a, a wide range of ways. Um, and then the last one I'll say is, is that the, through the use of online culture, um, and I talked to a class about this earlier, the use of humor and irony um, and wit and satire, often through memes, and through um, jokes that get told, 
even through emoji or other kinds of um, jokes and things online that then get evolve very organically into offline violence. And so we've seen this with the so-called boogaloo scenes, which are, it's a code for civil war that started as a joke uh, among teenagers online. We've seen it with the Pepe the Frog, um, co-opting of a Pepe the Frog cartoon that evolved through complicated ways into a fantastical, mythical white ethno state called Kekistan. And there's a flag which then waved at Charlottesville and waved on January 6th. So, you know, we see this offline and offline um, intersection in important ways. And I think the online world can mobilize, can radicalize, can introduce people, can recruit and live stream and amplify, but ultimately it still translates into violence in the real world, in the physical world, in the offline world, um, because uh, it's not just trolling and harassment, it's also, you know, uh, mass shootings and, and, and plots that we're worried about and, and seeing interrupted. So it's, it's that intersection, I think, that is um, really important to understand. So on this issue of um, the different aspects of extremism that are either supported or fueled um, via social media platforms, what can you say about, again, from the context of your own research and, and study, um, what seems to be similar to uh, mm -hmm. dynamics playing out in the US and Europe and where are, where are there key differences in this social media yeah. world? Great, great question. So I would say, first of all, it's global, right? This is happening almost everywhere. Um, you know, we, we really, uh, it's not just a US problem, but the US has a an outsized proportion of the terrorist violence, the incidents and the deaths. So um, when you look at something like the Global Terrorism Index, which has shown, I think, a 250% increase in, in far-right terror over the past five years across Western Europe, North America, um, and Oceania, Australia, New Zealand, um, about half of those incidents and half the deaths or so are in the U.S., even though there's a lot of other countries represented. So the U.S. has an, a bigger problem than most. Some of that is due to gun control issues um, and the easy accessibility of weapons, which leads to greater lethality. Um, but the problems of social media, of online interconnection, not only exist everywhere, but they're related to each other. So, you know, two of the last terrorist attacks in Germany were either their manifestos were either written in English or they were live streaming in English for a global audience, even though they're attacking immigrants or people deemed not to belong to their version of what constitutes Germanness, um, you know, within their own nationalist context. So, we we have see them you know we see far right actors white supremacist actors take inspiration from you know terrorist acts in in Oslo that inspires Christchurch and then Christchurch inspires a terrorist actor here in in El Paso so there's direct inspiration and sharing of of kind of tactics and procedures and bomb making uh, strategies and I, I'll say and I know this will be of interest to you with your um, work on jihadism it's not only even just globally among white supremacists, but sometimes we see the sharing of those of those bomb making and tact equipments across uh, across um, extremist ideological domains. So we've seen, you know, some very little but limited white supremacist extremist engagement on jihadi um, telegram channels, for example, and vice versa. Um, so hopefully, you know, that doesn't continue, and that 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 I have reason to believe I'm not that don't think that's a huge threat, but. But globally, those connections can be made in different ways. Um, other countries, there are two things that most other countries are doing that we're not doing, um, one, and, and which we might not want to do, right? One, one of which is more restrictions on speech um, and more restrictions on expression. So not just speech, but symbols and um, nonverbal speech, uh, nonverbal expressions, um, like memes or something like that, or video. Uh, that, you know, we have very, very strong free speech protections here. So we probably are not going to see the kinds of restrictions that you see in a place like Germany, where you cannot legally display the swastika. Uh, most other countries outside of the US have much stronger uh, restrictions on speech, and there's more criminal penalty for expressions of hate speech than we do. Um, and that's true for social media regulation as well. There's just more regulation, more government regulation of those things, more monitoring, more monitoring and reporting, more transparency to the public, more data collection. Um, and then finally, of course, because this is, I know we'll get into this, uh, but 
there's also a lot more investment in the prevention side and not just on the security and militarization sort of side of it. So, you know, not seeing this just as a hammer, but really investing uh, much more deeply with much bigger resources on the uh, very early, what we even call pre-prevention, just you know, strengthening of democracy um, and democratic values side of things. Great, thanks for that. Um... Cynthia, so we spent the la roughly the last 20, 25 minutes talking about different features of the threat, um, the role of social media and different other different radicalization pathways. But um, turning to the policy front now, uh, and you've already hinted at this, but I, I really want to get into um, to some of your thoughts, because we are a school of public policy. Um, where do you think the U.S. needs to do more on that front? And what are some possible approaches? And you can tackle these from the legal aspect, the governmental structure uh, aspect, um, how the non-governmental sort of options that are out there. But I think there's a lot to talk about from the solutions side of things. Yeah. Um, well, great questions. On the federal side, I think there already are some really big strides being made to address some of the things I'm about to say, which is, you know, uh, we need to approach this more as a public health crisis and not just a security one. So what that means is addressing it in a way that that situates the problem within communities and, and intervenes in a way that uh, roots solutions in local and, and state and regional needs, right? So meeting people where they are and understanding how to invest in some of the prevention. And I can talk about kind of what that means, but that is that is a public health approach to how you intervene. You can't just create policy top down and, and see change on the local level. Um, there's also, I think, more of an emphasis on, on these community-based solutions and on trying to expand this beyond the security agencies and and law enforcement agencies and intelligence side and see this not just as a monitoring and surveillance and arrest you know and prosecution problem but also one of how do you prevent radicalization and that involves you know health and human services and department of education and and other agencies beyond um and that is something that other countries do a lot of right so they have a dozen agencies involved in these issues rather than just a couple um, and, and we've already seen some of those strides, I think, in Biden administration's, the Biden administration's new um, domestic, uh, the strategy on domestic extremism or terrorism. We're already seeing a lot of that language, at least, and in the renaming of the Department of Homeland Security's uh, prevention age, you know, office uh, around community issues and moving into regional locations, as they've been doing, we are seeing some of those changes. Um, but I think that ultimately, uh, the real solutions are going to lie on the local and in the community levels. I mean, we need this work to be happening in schools. We need it to be happening in um, municipalities within offices and local unions and employers offices. We need it in faith communities, you know, where, you know, just the kind of lab that I run on, on, on where we work on prevention every day, we get, uh, just over the last month, probably 30 different inquiries from local partners asking us to help. We cannot do it, right? We need more people like us testing and designing interventions and scaling them up to local communities. But parents need help. Mental health counselors need help. How do you recognize the problem? How do you prevent people from being susceptible to the propaganda? How do you help them understand what online manipulation looks like? These are things that we have done very well for a generation now, understanding how online predators work, how to protect your digital privacy. We've invested in digital communications work for kids in schools, for example, but they really don't get enough about source integrity or what propaganda looks like. Um, and that's true for fifth graders and it's true for 50 year olds. I mean, we need more help to help people be less susceptible. And so that's, that's at the early end of this, um, you know, rather than seeing this just as you know, even in the best case scenario, leaving all the problems to law enforcement to solve. There was a terrorist in uh, Ireland and Northern Ireland many years ago who after the after a failed attempt on the royal family uh, to assassinate someone, he said, that's all right. You know, they have to get it right every time. We only have to get it right once. And I think that's, you know, ideally you want more investments early on so fewer people go into the pipeline is even in the best case scenario. Uh, we're expecting on the intelligence and security law enforcement side, perfection. And we know that that's impossible. From your um, 
previous sort of grounding uh, on the academic side in sociology and education. Um, is there a parallel program that exists in at least modern U.S. history mm -hmm. that the at least the security side of the of the fence um, could look at as something that delivered similar results, even if the output or the intended you know, focus mm -hmm. was was different? Or is this something that's going to have to be completely designed from whole cloth? And as you and I have discussed yeah. um, before we met today, that this is something the government struggled with for you know quite a long time post 9-11 on the jihadist terrorism front. Yeah. But I wonder if this is, just requires a completely new paradigm yeah. approach for what we're dealing with now, or if there is something in the historical record or archives that that would at least, again, give uh, a more kind of focused yeah. direction for folks. So the good news is there are models, I think, but the bad news is I don't think they're in the US. Um, so meaning that I think other countries, both I would say Norway, Germany, New Zealand, who have all really grappled with resurgent uh, far-right extremism, particularly on the white supremacist side in recent years with awful attacks, have put forward really interesting national plans that integrate much earlier intervention and prevention and community-based work, um, sometimes that relies on a lot of trust with law enforcement in ways that are going to be more challenging in the U.S. I mean, there are cultural differences, but for example, in Germany, where they just invested a billion euro uh, in their prevention national plan, which is inconceivable to us, uh, it's called the 80, there are 89 specific measures in the plan, and it's called the 89 measures to combat racism and right-wing extremism. In New Zealand, their Christchurch plan includes a national center of excellence on social diversity, inclusion, and uh, the prevention of violent extremism. So what these countries are doing, I think, is understanding that you cannot, when one of the drivers is the factual changes on, demographically that are being weaponized by extremist content and propaganda into a sense of threat, that you cannot really effectively address some of these issues with rising white supremacist extremism and domestic terror without also thinking about how are we going to live together in communities and as a nation with greater social cohesion, with greater sense of inclusion and belonging. Um, and I think the US, we saw that in, in, Biden's, uh, in the Biden administration's plan, in their fourth pillar of that plan, if anyone has read it, they do actually acknowledge, you know, they, they recognize that you can't really address some of these issues without addressing polarization and racism and gun control issues. I mean, they, there are other issues that have to be addressed, um, but we haven't as a country really grappled with how do you address uh, these issues of social inclusion at the same time as you address these issues of, um, of rising violent extremism. And I think they've, they basically have been divided up into different compartments um, in, in most of the um, agencies that for resource reasons and expertise reasons. And I think one of the things that has to happen is to find a way to have those conversations. We do have experts on social inclusion and we also have experts on extremism and radicalization. And the more we can bring people like that together to think about it, um, you know, ultimately, I, in the last chapter of this book, I open with a question from a German politician who asked about diversity curriculum. He said, why do we always talk about this as something that has to be strategic or instrumental or you know, these different reasons? What if instead we just ask the question of what would it take for everyone who lives in a country to feel at home there, right? What would it take for everyone to feel at home in the country where they live? And that's a, that's a surprisingly hard question to answer. Um, and it means talking about social cohesion and social inclusion while you're also talking about the violent fringe, right? Um, and how those things interact. So th that is a hard conversation to have in a security space. It's not a typical conversation to have in a security space. And so I, I don't know the answer. I mean, you, you've you spent your career in that world and um, maybe it's not, and that's why maybe the federal level is not the place to have those conversations. Maybe it is the local level, community level. I, I don't know. I, I know we need to have it. I'm not sure how you make it happen. Yeah, thanks for that, Cynthia. And um, I know you and I could probably talk for a long time about a lot of these topics. I'm gonna ask you one more question and then we're gonna get yeah. start getting to audience Q&A and I, I start to see some popping up. Uh, 
in the chat box here. So my last question for you, um, another one of these ones where you may not have a good answer, but I'll, I'll ask it anyways. Uh, so again, if, if January 6th, in your opinion, was not sort of the culmination of all these different factors and drivers and, and you, know, you don't see the threat um, uh, sort of diminishing anytime soon, um, do you think, if that's indeed the case, that do you think that now is the time for some deeper kind of governmental reform, at least at the federal level, or restructuring? Um, because in the aftermath of 9-11, in my own careers, you hinted at sort of rode that post-9-11 wave of governmental reform and change in, in counterterrorism and intelligence and homeland security. Do you think we're at that moment now and there's the need for that deep structural reform or that is just it's a different type of issue here in the United States? And this may not again, all the solutions may not be parked on the federal side. Yeah, I mean, you know, what's interesting is I think, yes, I think we do need some reform and there is a moment for deep structural reform and for rethinking the kinds of expertise that are needed to be in the room, um, you know, for these kinds of conversations and for for policy solutions. But I also think this is a much trickier moment. Uh, you know, after 9-11, again, I wasn't on this side of the conversations at that point, but my sense is there was a much more consensus, bipartisan consensus and agreement, and it was much less politicized. There was a universal agreement about a sense of threat and people moved forward as a nation, kind of whether that was problematic or not, civil rights violation, there were a lot of problems with the way we actually moved forward. but. Um, you know, right now we're in, a, it's very difficult, I think, even to reach agreement about how to describe the threat, the vocabulary that we're using. We don't even have the same words in use across our own agencies to describe the phenomenon. Um, so we've got, you know, the State Department and Justice using racially and ethnically motivated violent extremism. We've got Homeland Security and Congress using white supremacist extremism, just as one example. Now we've got this broader umbrella, domestic, uh, violent extremism, DVE being used, but we are we are still so much even in the and then global you know other countries use totally different words like right wing extremism or right wing radicalism in Germany. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done. I feel like before we can even think about how you would restructure um, at the government level to address it, I feel like we have to form some consensus about. How do we define the problem and what are some strategies to um, to address it? And one of the reasons why I like the focus on pre-preventative stuff is because usually we can all agree that uh, it's easier to get agreement, actually, on the idea that we need to make people less susceptible to online manipulation, um, whether people will agree with what that online manipulation looks like. You know, so it's not it's ideologically neutral. In other words, it's about um, manipulative, persuasive tactics, regardless of the extremist group that are putting them forward. Um, so yes, I do think we need it. I think um, I'm not super optimistic right now, just based on on the kind of, it's a, it's a very difficult time, I think, um, to find consensus. Well, your, your um, comments that are a little more sort of not, I wouldn't say pessimistic, but sort of sober and and clear-eyed, then you'd be a perfect government counterterrorism analyst, because that's pretty much the line we we take all the time. Um, but but anyways, uh, all kidding aside, thanks for sharing your your insights, um, Cynthia, with me. And now we've got several questions uh, in the chat box. Hopefully we'll have time to get through all of them, but I'll start with the ones uh, that my colleague Daniel Rifkin has, has put in the, um, the chat. So the first one is, is the prevalence of these myriad groups due to people looking for intersectional support for issue combinations, or do they tend to be one issue groups and have and have they to or, or and they have to join as, as many to get covered? I don't know if I yeah, yeah I think I understand that one. Yeah, I think I understand the question. So you know, I will say, and I, I said this in the class earlier today too. So sorry, Joe, you're hearing this again, but I um. You know, I think a lot of people think about these groups as being and movements and scenes as just being fueled by people who are really angry and full of hate. And what what I find actually is that people are usually drawn into them for more positive um, or aspirational kinds of qualities. And we see that particularly, for example, with veterans, uh, but others as well who are drawn to language in the propaganda that's very clear about a sense of belonging, a sense of purpose. Um, a sense of meaning, 
brotherhood, belonging, loyalty, um, you know, uh, things like you'll never be alone, you know, you'll never, you'll always, have, will always have your back, like you're a part of something. And so, you know, I find that people often, what we often see happen is people are looking for something. They're looking for meaning. They're looking for a sense of purpose. They are depressed. They're online. They're anxious. You know, they're going sometimes to self-help forums and that those are targeted um, we know that those are targeted in time you know, with extremist groups. They're playing games online. They're trying to find a sense of community and connect with others. And during that process, they sometimes encounter people who have deliberately put out or are sharing extremist content, whether those come from groups or from individuals who are sharing that propaganda. And it often meets them in a really gradual way and shows them, uh, gives them a, a, a a sense of purpose. We've heard this from former extremists who say things like, I found a sense of family there. Um, those guys were my brothers. I would never let them down. We see real parallels with a lot of gang violence uh, as well, where people often feel, you know, really deeply a part of something. So I'm not saying that it is a positive thing. I'm saying they're attracted for positive things. With veterans, we often see that they are attracted to the language of defense, of protection, of being patriotic or being a hero. And all of that language is there from extremist groups who say, you're coming here to defend the constitution from tyranny, it's just being twisted, right? So it's a twisting of something that has actually, you know, drew them into the military in the first place for positive reasons or positive qualities that is being then manipulated by others with real propaganda. So, you know, I, I don't know that my view generally has been and what I found in research from both lots of interviews over the years and um, long study of the iconography and propaganda is that people are emotionally drawn in before they are drawn into the ideology. In most cases, the ideology comes second after they're drawn in for these other reasons. Um, and that's true. That has some parallels with some of the jihadi and, and uh, ISIS foreign fighter recruitment as well. The idea that you're restoring a caliphate, the idea that you're restoring, you know, a fantastical white ethnic, ethno state. I mean, a lot of these things are territorial and based on a sense of purity, but they're also calling on people to heroically engage to protect and defend and support their communities. So um, I that's my experience and my research and the evidence that I've drawn on has shown that that's how people are drawn in. Um, but, you know, we're also seeing really rapidly changing dynamics and who radicalizes much older right now, more women um, being brought into it. And so these things are changing as we speak too. So I would say stay tuned for more research. And even um, from the, the number of people arrested and or charged, um, in the aftermath of January 6th, I think that that pool sort of underscores some of those findings that you just yeah. mentioned. So I think that's that's pretty interesting. Yeah, and when you, actually when you hear interviews with them too, people who were interviewed by the media, they I think almost everybody I've heard an interview with, they really believed really deeply that they were the ones who were acting courageously, you know, to save democracy from tyranny. So they, they were deep believers and believed this was their patriotic duty. So it doesn't mean it's not illegal, right? Um, like belief in disinformation doesn't excuse a criminal act, but it means that they were drawn into it for reasons that we might be able to understand a little bit and direct in an earlier way toward a more positive outcome. Great. Thanks for that, Cynthia. Okay, next question. Uh, and I'll try not to, to uh, I'll try to read this one properly. How do we communicate to someone that they may be on the path to hate or radicalization? Oh, this is a really tough one. So basically, you know, it's like anything else, you know, an ounce of prevention, right, is worth a pound of cure. It's, it is far easier to prevent somebody from getting engaged with extremism than it is to de-radicalize them. De-radicalization, in fact, I think is extremely difficult, takes years typically, and uh, there's no evidence or very, there's no evidence that can be scaled up essentially. So, you know, there's a very individual kind of process that requires a lot of one-on-one um, -on -one intervention, particularly if there are conspiracy theories involved um, with, uh, with someone who they know and trust, right? Because they're not going to trust an outsider who is often then seen as part of the conspiracy. Um, so, uh, it's really difficult. What we usually do when we get these queries is refer people to two groups, one called Life After Hate um, and the other called um, uh, uh, Parents for Peace. 
I have a partnership in my lab with the Southern Poverty Law Center. Um, we have a number of tools that are all free and downloadable, available. I can drop it in the chat in a minute. Um, on, it's housed on a special site on the Southern Poverty Law Center's website, also in multiple languages that are tools for parents and caregivers that we've tested with parents and caregivers to see that they're effective. Counselors, teachers, um, coaches, even other youth, other people who work with youth, they're all youth focused in that area. Um, but that help people recognize really early warning signs because the more they get down that path, the harder it is. So I don't have a great answer for you on, uh, you know, how can you communicate other than that? Um, it doesn't help to come at it with facts, generally speaking. Um, and it's better to approach it from it is uh, the evidence shows that it's better to approach people with, um, with evidence about how manipulation works than it is to tell them about the facts. I'll just give one example um, without running too much over time. You know, we, a lot of our research draws on public health research that, for example, that shows after decades of trying to teach teenagers about healthy eating habits by telling them about the long-term consequences of bad choices for their BMI or diabetes or whatever, it had zero impact on the choices they make about what they eat. Um, but when researchers designed a study that taught them how fast food companies were manipulating them with advertisements to make choices that were not in their own best interest for their bodies, but were lining the pockets of those companies, that did teach, that did change the behavior of kids and it changed the behavior of boys more than girls. So what we take away from that is, you know, nobody likes to find out they're being manipulated, especially teenage boys. And so if you can help them understand more critically why they don't want to be a pawn in somebody else's game, Try to understand what what might be behind a motivation of somebody else sharing that propaganda or disinformation. That is a step that can help. But for somebody who's already radicalized, uh, you really have to get professional help. Right, and we would see that in the jihadist uh, extremism world uh, in my time in government, and and hear the stories of how families struggled with those very personal decisions about do I. Uh, inform law enforcement about these possible signs of radicalization that I'm seeing with my with my family members and then what are the consequences of making those decisions and I think we're seeing the same thing play out now in a different type of threat okay um, some additional questions populating here um, to what extent can content moderation systems sift through the nuances of types of far right far right content and community forums and predict harmful outcomes? Yeah, I see the whole the content moderation world and uh, also tweaks to algorithms, changes to algorithms that try to prevent, you know, things like, for example, more salacious content from being uh, amplified uh, or that try to prevent people from being exposed. They're all and, and deplatforming. These are all really, really helpful tactics and strategies that have been shown to reduce the spread of disinformation significantly, for example. Um, but they're always a band-aid solution. It's, you know, the, to me, anything on the content moderation, deplatforming side is already going to be too little too late by the time, you know, by the time you remove the content, a lot of people have already been exposed to it. By the time you remove the bad actor um, and kick deplatform them, they've got 10, 15, 20,000 followers behind who've been following that toxic material that don't get any explanation typically of, of why that, why that suddenly just they're, they're the person left the platform. Um, and so much like the way I see law enforcement and security solutions as the Band-Aid solution at the end, that we want to reduce this, the flow, we want to reduce the bubble that goes into that. We also want that on the on the social media and the online worlds. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's exhausting to even think about. It's insufficient what's happening on the content moderation, but there's you know tens of thousands of content moderators employed across these platforms. Um, and they're not able to keep up. And we know real harm is happening. So even in the best case scenario, it's not enough. Um, it can make a difference. It does make a difference. It's better than not having it at all, but uh, it can't be the only solution, I guess. So sticking with this content moderation um, topic and going back to the broader um, points we discussed earlier about the role of social media, one thing you didn't necessarily address, um, and. I just didn't give you the prompt, but maybe this is a good uh, time to do it now. And this is a really esoteric thing that I'm not sure a lot of our listeners and viewers might know. So it'd be great to get a, a minute or two of your 
thoughts on this, but where do you see the whole Section 230 debate of the 1996 Communication Decency Act, you know, in this broad, broader conversation about the impact on prevention and countering far right extremism? I know, again, it's a very technical thing, but it's so important. Yeah. I mean, this question about regulation um, of the social media companies is is an enormous part of, of what we're talking about here. You know, my personal view on it is that um, I, I want someone to be having that conversation. I want really smart people in the room when that's happening. And I still don't think it's going to solve even in the best, even if the best solution is arrived at, whatever that solution is, it's always still the Band-Aid solution, the regulation, anything that involves the regulation of content is always going to happen after the fact in my mind, right? By the time you recognize that bad content is out there and, and deal with it, um, it's, it's just really, really because of the coding, right? So, you know, in, in Germany, when I was first studying this stuff, uh, one of the schools outside of Berlin banned the number 88 from display because eight is for the eighth letter of the alphabet for HH for Heil Hitler. And immediately kids were wearing t-shirts that said 100 minus 12 or 87 plus one, right? That we see that that kind of game playing is constant. It is it is endemic to the system. As soon as something is banned, Boogaloo becomes Big Igloo, becomes Big Luau, becomes something else, becomes Hawaiian shirts, um, you know, at protests. So it's not that I don't think it's important and, and maybe this is a dodge of the question at all, you know, is that it's not my area of expertise on the regulation side and I want someone to do it, but I think it's insufficient no matter what. Uh, and, you know, my goal is to draw more attention to the much earlier prevention so that we have less content to deal with that's nefarious. Yeah, no, you're you're more focused on the upstream aspect than the downstream right. kind exactly. of swatting yeah. of flies. Um, okay, time for probably a couple more questions. Um, do you see the... Do you see what the role of women in domestic extremism increasing, especially in what's playing out in some of these local school board settings, if you've been following the news um, on some of those conversations? Yeah, the role of women is definitely increasing. It's been going on for, I would say, about eight or nine years, maybe a little bit longer. And I, I'd say there are a couple different things happening. One is that um, historically, these extremist, domestic extremist groups also have tremendous misogyny going on in them and uh, sometimes assault of women, but also just there's no way for, there, it's been very difficult for women to be taken seriously within those scenes and movements. And so they have stayed in the background. They haven't played much of a role historically. Now that's not to say they were in, unimportant as somebody has famously said prior, you know, it's not my, my line, but somebody was sewing those Ku Klux Klan hoods, right? Like somebody, you know, there was always a backdrop to what was going on that was enabling these movements. But social media and online platforms have totally transformed that because women no longer have to physically experience the misogyny or the danger of these movements for them. And they have stepped into some real leadership roles on the recruitment um, and radicalization side by streaming content, by recruiting other women, by producing Instagram um, accounts that are really aesthetically quite appealing, that integrate wellness, that integrate, um, you know, attacks on traditional medicine, but embed those with uh, conceptions of purity that integrate food and cooking uh, with idea and 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 homeschooling and ideas about traditional. Um, uh, life and traditional roles as women and as mothers with content about purity and raising white babies, right? So it's this, so it's drawn out and attracted more women to that. And they're also um, using the same tactics that anybody builds on social media to attract more followers with really parasocial relationships and, and content that is appealing to people like makeup tutorials or cooking shows or something like that. So we've seen a lot more engagement on that side. And then the conspiracy stuff, the QAnon stuff has attracted a lot of women through the yoga and wellness movement as well, along with those intersections with the anti-vax movement. So that, that's where you start to get these strange coalitions emerging where anti-vax, traditionally people who might've been more on the left or a little um, lefty liberal hippie has seeing alignment with, um, with the kind of anti-government folks who are now in a COVID era um, emerging more as anti-vax uh, uh, advocates. And so 
that's where we've been seeing a lot more of the women. And we saw that on January 6th, very obviously, I think. Um, and we're also finally seeing more women coming out of active duty military. And so because veterans groups are targeted um, and military is targeted by some of these you know, unlawful militia movements, we would probably also see some of the same trends there as well. And just as a side note, um, for those who are students of, of terrorism, both at home and abroad, if you go back to the late 60s into the 70s to the early 1980s, if you look at the way terrorist groups had uh, leaders or women who were leaders in those groups or actual sort of operatives and attack plotters and planners, that was definitely much more of a dynamic then um, across the threat spectrum, both from the, the far right and the far left. I would argue it's, it's more recently coming up now, but going back almost 50 years, um, even in the United States, the, the role of women in extremism here was was far more pronounced than I would mm -hmm. say is now. Um, okay, time for one last question. Um, and it's a very profound one, um, but I think it's also, it's a good way to end this conversation here. So um, the question is, what can the average person do to help combat domestic terrorism? Hmm, great question. Uh, one, I think is, I would say just a couple things. One, to be better informed. Um, so again, most of my work has focused on youth over the years because youth have historically been at the greatest risk for violence. And what we see again and again are adults in these communities, parents, caregivers, teachers, who recognize red flags far too late. Um, once it's already far down the, the, the radicalization trajectory and it's really difficult to turn that person back. So. I think staying informed, and again, we have some of these tools on, I'll just say it out loud, it's www.splcenter.org backslash peril. Um, so the Southern Poverty Law Center's website, and they have a, a page for peril for my lab, which has all the tools on it. So we have found that that really does help empirically um, uh, help people feel more equipped to recognize uh, red flags and more empowered to intervene if they do know a child. And then there are lots of resources on there for where people can go for additional help. Um, I think people also need to pay more attention to uh, the way that victims of rising hate um, are uh, are affected and and to be more responsive. So we have we often focus a lot on the perpetrators of rising violence and don't spend enough time looking at uh, targeted groups and the victims of those uh, communities. And so supporting um, the victims of rising hate uh, and communities who are experiencing that, you know, we've seen really high levels of anti-Semitism, of uh, anti-Muslim hate over the past couple of years and of anti-Asian hate, not only from the white supremacist spectrum, but rising uh, across the board on domestic extremism. And so I think uh, we often have to focus a little bit more on, on some of those targeted groups and not just on thinking about how to devote more resources to the perpetrators of hate as well. Um, and then, yeah, the last thing I think, thinking about any way that we can reduce polarization, which we know is fueling some of the political violence and um, the willingness and support for political violence is probably the thing that troubles me the most right now, um, you know, because we know that that underpins some of the fringe activity. But it also means that uh, we're more likely to see the kind of violence that we've been seeing at school board meetings or parent getting angry at a teacher for asking their child to wear a mask or just the, the physical violence and harm against healthcare workers, et cetera, that is not quite in the traditional wheelhouse of domestic violent extremism, but it's some of which is motivated politically as well. So, um, so I think thinking about ways in every small community to reduce polarization and form better ways of kind of protecting democratic values are, are a positive step forward. So great question to end this conversation on. So Cynthia, thank you so much for spending uh, not only this hour with us, but um, the day today. You spoke to my class earlier, and I know the students really enjoyed hearing from you. Always great to, to have um, Ford and Michigan alums uh, back here on campus. Open invitation to come back uh, anytime. And thanks to my colleagues at the Ford School, Daniel Ripkin and Aaron Flores from the communications an outreach team who really put this together and my colleagues as well from the Wiser Diplomacy Center for just giving me the opportunity to be part of the team here. Um, so with that, um, thanks again to everyone who watched and listened. And this will also be um, 
recorded uh, and uploaded for future viewing and hope to see you on the next policy talk. So thank you again. Thank you. Go Blue. Thanks for having me.